arteries slashed by homicidal roosters, a moronic robber who thought a gun store would make a perfect score, a rogue missionary meeting the arrows of islanders who really don't like guests. Crime doesn't pay, or so that's what they say. Today we're going to take a look at criminals who helped prove that old adage as true. This is Dumb Ways to Die, Criminal Edition. In 1980, Michael Godwin, a 21-year-old South Carolina man, was charged with the murder of 24-year-old Mary Elizabeth Royam. Royam had been found in her apartment in West Columbia beaten to death with an electric iron. At the time of the murder, Godwin had been on work release from a local prison. He'd already been serving time for robbing a woman at knife point three years earlier. The case went to trial in 1981. Godwin would be convicted of murder and sentenced to the electric chair in 1983, but he was later commuted to life in prison after a retrial cleared him of the sexual assault charge. But Godwin didn't actually escape the electric chair. Godwin had been trying to fix a pair of earphones that connected to his television when he bit into a wire and electrocuted himself while sitting on a metal toilet. Godwin had accidentally made an electric chair all his own. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. In 2017, Hidir Korkmaz was a 42-year-old Turkish-Dutch drug dealer and informant. He'd been set to testify against Willem Holira, a Dutch criminal kingpin, when he was found dead. Was he taken out by one of Holira's men? Would the investigators have to open up a homicide case? No, because Korkmaz died when he was fishing. In what can only be described as a bizarre accident, his fish hook accidentally hit an electricity pole. Since Korkmaz didn't ask for money or a lesser sentence, he was considered a reliable witness. The only thing he'd asked for was protection. It's just a shame that the courts couldn't protect him from his own fishing hook. Holiter is currently serving a life sentence in a high-security prison, but underwent heart surgery in July 2023. In April 2019, there was a two-day search of South Africa's Kruger National Park for the body of a suspected rhino poacher. They were only able to recover a pair of pants and a skull. The poacher, along with a group of other men, entered the park illegally to hunt rhinoceros. His accomplices would tell the authorities the poacher had been trampled by an elephant. It's likely that after being trampled, his body was devoured by a pride of lions. Around the time the poacher died, the biggest haul of rhino horns in five years was seized at the Hong Kong airport. It was valued at $2.1 million. Cockfighting is a blood sport where humans will pit two roosters against each other in a small ring. They have to fight to the death while taking bets on who will win. It's currently illegal in all 50 states, and for good reason. In 2011, Jose Luis Ochoa, a 35-year-old man from California, died after a cockfight. In a twist of poetic justice, he was killed by one of the roosters. His cause of death was recorded as a sharp force injury. It's unclear if his reluctance to go to the hospital contributed to his death. The rooster had a knife strapped to it, and when it reportedly jumped at Ochoa, it stabbed him in the right calf. This isn't the only cockfighting death of this nature. There are at least two recorded incidents in India. In 2020, an Andhra Pradesh man had also attached a blade to his bird. While on his way to the cockfight, the bird he'd attached the sharp blade to cut him in the throat, leading to his death. In 2021, in southern India, a rooster with a knife attached to it killed its owner. While the bird tried to escape, he stabbed the owner in the groin. The bird's owner would die of blood loss. It's almost a complete repeat of what happened to Ochoa in California. I guess if you breed birds for fighting, you should not be surprised when they pick a fight with you, especially if you hand them the knife. Now we all hate spam texts, but did you know that a spam text might have saved hundreds of lives? A Russian woman who's been referred to as the Black Widow was a member of a militant group involved in the Domodedovo International Airport bombing. The airport bombing claimed 35 lives on January 24, 2011. The Black Widow was a wannabe bomber who was at a house while preparing for an attack on New Year's Eve at Red Square. Her cell phone would act as the bomb's detonator. Her plans were foiled by a spam text wishing her a happy new year. The text triggered the bomb, killing her instantly. The accomplices, a man and a woman, managed to escape the home. When phones are used as a detonator, they're usually left off until the last minute. This Russian terrorist's careless and stupid mistake killed her and saved hundreds of lives. It might have been one of the few times when we were grateful for a spam text. John Chow isn't a criminal in the traditional sense, but he did die doing something illegal. So he technically counts for our dumb ways to die criminal edition. The North Sentinel Island, one of the Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean, is home to the Sentinelese, an isolated tribe. The tribe rejects all contact with outsiders. It's actually illegal to go within three miles of it, and for good reason. Not only is the island dangerous, but outsiders are a threat to the tribe's people there. Since they aren't used to a lot of modern diseases, the entire tribe could be wiped out by any disease a tourist would bring with them. Enter John Chow. 
a 26-year-old evangelical missionary and an adventure blogger. He even had a quote from Jim Elliott on his Facebook, who was one of the five missionaries killed by a tribe in Ecuador. Little did he know he had inadvertently predicted his fate. John Chow illegally approached the island three times. He was first taken to the island by a fisherman. He stripped down to his underwear to try to fit in with the tribe and paddled his kayak to the island. When the tribe noticed him, he shouted, My name is John. I love you and Jesus loves you. When the tribe's people took aim at him, Chow tried to give them fish as a gift, but he would eventually have to retreat. He made another attempt later that day and actually landed on the island. He laid out more gifts. When the Sentinelese attempted to attack, according to Chow's account of the event, he shouted their words back at him and made them laugh. He began singing worship songs and preaching from Genesis. They tolerated his presence for the time being. One of the boys in the tribe shot an arrow through Chow's waterproof Bible. Chow would remove the arrow to return it before retreating from the island once again. Before going a third and final time, Chow wrote to his family, You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Chow went alone, believing the tribe's people would be less threatened if he was alone. He also didn't want the fishermen to be forced to witness his death if it went badly. Chow knew he was playing a deadly game and went just the same. On November 16th, the fishermen dropped Chow off alone. That was the last time he was ever seen alive. He was killed by the tribe. Chow's father feels as though the American missionary community bears the responsibility for what happened to his son. To some, Chow was a martyr, but many denounce his actions, including those in the Christian community. For our list, we also have to consider him a criminal, since at the time of his death he was breaking the law. Had he simply listened to Indian law and kept away from the island, he would still be with us today. We've all heard stories of thieves breaking into ATMs with explosives. Although there's been a rise in ATM robbery, it's still considered rare compared to how many ATMs exist globally. On September 26, 2009 in Belgium, a pair of thieves plotted to steal cash from an ATM with dynamite. The pair overestimated just how much dynamite they would need. They used enough to demolish the entire building the bank was in. One of the burglars was rushed to the hospital, but he was declared dead on arrival. Authorities had assumed the second thief escaped until his body was found underneath the rubble of the building. Fortunately, no one was in the building at the time of the blast. The only victims of the explosion were the criminals themselves. In September 2010 in Tilbury, England, 20-year-old Paul Fox was killed while trespassing on railroad tracks. It's not unusual for people to steal copper from the railroad tracks, but it is a dangerous crime. Fox's friend, 22-year-old Jay Cossens, had been with him that night. They'd gone at midnight to steal cables for the copper inside of them. They'd already collected three or four copper wires that they'd set aside when they went for another one. Fox pulled down another wire, but the other end hit a live cable. Fox was electrocuted, bumping into Cossens and knocking him over. Cossens would suffer burns to his left hand, but he was able to call an ambulance. He was on the phone with paramedics for 45 minutes, and they would talk him through giving Fox CPR. But there was nothing Cossens could do. At 3 a.m., Fox was pronounced dead at the scene. It's believed that the cable Fox held must have come into contact with an overhead line, killing him. Robberies are common, and it's not unusual for criminals to get away scot-free. They often target gas stations and 7-Elevens, but 33-year-old David Zabak had a different plan. In Renton, Washington in 1990, Zabak made a fatal mistake of trying to rob the Renton Highlands gun shop, H&J Leather and Firearms Limited. There had also been a police car stationed outside of the shop at the time of the robbery. During the ordeal, he was shot when the police officer and a store clerk opened fire on him. Zabak had fired first, sealing his fate. He died at 8.15 p.m. at Harborview Medical Center. While we don't want to give people tips on how to commit crimes, we will say it's maybe a good idea not to rob a place that is armed to the teeth. Now let's go to Bloemfontein, South Africa in 2005 where a South African mugger was mauled to death by Bengal tigers. The man robbed a couple at knife point before he fled the scene of the crime. Security guards chased him, and he tried to seek refuge in the nearby zoo, landing in the tiger enclosure where he was mauled to death. You can say he successfully evaded the police since they didn't find him, but his corpse was later found by a zookeeper who came to care for the tigers. This isn't the first time a criminal tried to hide in the zoo in South Africa. The other incident took place in 1997 in Max the Gorilla's enclosure. The gorilla was badly injured by Isaac Mofokeng, who was trying to escape the police. Fortunately, the gorilla lived, and Mofokeng was convicted of robbery and wounding a gorilla. Let's turn to the skies for some stupid sky crimes. In the Philippines on May 25, 2000, Augusto Lacandula hijacked Philippine Airlines Flight 812. 
The flight left Francisco Bangoy Airport in Davao at 2 p.m. with 278 passengers, three pilots, nine flight attendants, and two cabin crew trainers. In what has been described as an amateurish robbery, as the plane was preparing to land at Ninoy Aquino International Airport, La Kundala put on a blue ski mask and swim goggles. He had managed to smuggle a gun and a grenade with him, marching right on up to the forward gallery to point a handgun at the flight attendant Margaret Bueno's head. He announced that this was a holdup. La Candula kept Bueno with him as he made his way to the cockpit to make demands of the pilots. La Candula shot into the aircraft bulkhead in order to get into the flight deck. After he was able to get into the cockpit, La Candula kept his gun in his right hand while his other hand held the grenade that was already missing its safety pin. Francis Cable, the head of the cabin crew on the flight, remained calm and made his way to the cockpit. As if the lead character in an action film, Cable made eye contact with La Candula, who pressed the gun against Cable's forehead. Cable would tell him in Cebuano, You're my brother. Don't let anything bad happen to our flight. Don't hurt anyone. Tell me your problem and I will help you. According to Cable, La Candula needed money. Cable gave La Candula cash from his wallet and went to the PA system to ask the flight attendants to collect voluntary donations from the other passengers. Cable, not wanting to cause a panic, avoided using the words hijacking or robbery. La Candula demanded the pilots turn back to return to Davao, but he was told they didn't have enough fuel to make the trip. La Candula would send someone to give him his backpack from his seat. Once he had his backpack, he removed a change of clothing and then had someone put the backpack on him. When the plane was flying over Antipolo City, La Candula pulled out a nylon parachute that looked like it might have just been a repurposed tent. At least that's what the witnesses said it looked like. After getting advice from the pilots on how to jump from the plane, La Candula asked for the rear door to be opened. Unaware how that wasn't possible, had they opened the door mid-flight, it would have caused rapid depressurization inside of the plane. Everything near the opening would have been blown out the door. But objections were met with threats, so Cable took La Candula to the rear. When the door opened, Cable was knocked off his feet but managed to stay inside. La Candula seemed to be having second thoughts, but attempted to jump. La Candula would become stuck against the opening. Cable made the decision to push him out of the plane. La Candula plunged to his death. His remains were recovered three days later. It's possible he had survived the fall and drowned, but that's not clear. Croatia has a few dumb criminals of its own. Bojan Besic is one of those criminals. He was a small-time criminal with a long rap sheet. One of his most egregious crimes was sending death threats to his ex-girlfriend. He was sentenced to eight months in prison for threatening her. On November 16, 2015, Besic would end up in solitary confinement during his prison stay. Unbeknownst to the guards, Besic had smuggled a lighter into the room. With his hands tied behind his back, Besic managed to get the lighter out of his pocket and purposefully started a fire by the door. We imagine he hoped that the fire would get the guards to let him out. Unfortunately for Besic, things didn't go according to his plan. The guards didn't notice the smoke in time to save him. He was burned alive that day. Later, the surveillance footage would be leaked to the public. Now, thanks to Elizabeth Banks, we're sure you've heard of Cocaine Bear. But let's talk about the real-life circumstances that led to an American black bear overdosing on cocaine. Andrew C. Thornton II was once a Lexington Police Department narcotics officer, but he became a drug smuggler. One morning in September 1985 in Knoxville, Fred Myers, an 84-year-old man, noticed a man lying in his yard when he went to shave. Myers went outside to see if the man was all right, only to discover he was dead. It was the corpse of Andrew C. Thornton II. Myers noticed an unopened parachute and green army duffel bag strapped to Thornton's body. But why was Thornton in his yard? What had happened? Police investigated the scene and concluded that Thornton must have died upon impact when his parachute failed to open. Investigators also noticed that Thornton had night vision goggles and a bulletproof vest. Thornton must have jumped from his plane during the night, which was incredibly dangerous. The contents of his bag confused investigators further when they found two pistols, knives, $4,500 in cash, and 80 pounds of cocaine, which was valued at $15 million. They would later find his crashed plane in the Nantahala National Forest in North Carolina, which was 70 miles away from where his body was found. If you do know the story of Cocaine Bear, also known as Pablo Escobar and Cory the Bear, you know what happened to Thornton. He had been trafficking cocaine to the United States from Colombia. You could say that Thornton had been testing his luck as he frequently flew across the border and dropped cargo into the wilderness. Thornton would usually bail from the plane, but on this trip he was paranoid. He feared that federal agents were following the plane, so he threw three 70-pound duffel bags of cocaine out of the plane. Normally, Thornton would jump after his associate, Bill Leonard, but this time he attached himself to the last duffel bag, engaged the autopilot, and jumped. The plane would crash, and while Leonard would land safely, Thornton died. 
No one knows why his parachute failed, but given how risky it is to jump from a plane as part of your drug trafficking strategy, it is a pretty dumb way to die. Now, if you're wondering what happened to the real-life cocaine bear, we're sad to report that after eating a large amount of cocaine that had been dumped from the plane, the black bear died of an overdose. If you liked this video, be sure to watch Dumb Ways to Die British Edition and Dumbest Ways to Die USA Edition.